Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of Get Out of Rat. This is the hundredth episode, uh, and I asked a lot of friends to come and uh, join me for this one. It, I was just saying I'm more nervous doing the hundred than any of the preceding ninety-nine. Well, maybe the first one actually with uh, Mia, my daughter, um, who is still going to be. She is going to feature on this one in some small way. Uh, she's still not a fan of the podcast or any of my work, <laughs> especially not the dad jokes. Um, but I want to thank everyone that's joined and we're going to go around the room and introduce ourselves now. If I could start with you, Sarah, please. Hi, thank you, Martin. Uh, and thanks for inviting me on on this little piece of history, 100 episodes. I can't believe it. Uh, so I think that I know most everybody anyway, I'm um, Sarah Hunt, I'm a contact centre professional um, and um, me and Martin got together and we, we talked about the podcast way back when, when he first started thinking about doing it and I can't believe he's got to 100 episodes, it's amazing, well done um, and I just said we need to do something to celebrate it, let's sit down and do some celebrations and record the episode with all our friends and people in, that we know in the industry and here we are. So we're really excited to be here. Thanks, Martin. So Stuart. Yeah, hi guys. Um, again, I know most of you already, but for those of you that don't, Stu Dorman, Chief Innovation Officer at Sabio. Uh, been working in this industry for over 20 years now. Um, I'm trying to think of how long since I've known, you know, certainly you, Martin, certainly probably 10 of those years, you know, probably like most of you guys, Martin, through the industry judging events, that kind of thing. Uh, instantly struck up a great relationship and and but it was really when you started doing the podcast that I realized your talent as a as an interviewer really in a broadcaster and you know it's great it's a privilege to be here on the 100th episode it's great to have been involved in previous episodes I love this medium I love the podcast medium it's a great way to give people space to express themselves and to give the listener a space to be able to consume information and hear from all the great people that you've had on the podcast so yeah thanks for having me again great to be here you Who have to choose the next, next person, yeah, choose. Uh, Neris, go. Oh, thanks, Stu. Hi, everyone, I'm Neris. Also, Buddy, who I'll inevitably be joined with. Interestingly, it's quite appropriate because Buddy and I listen to the podcast when we're dog, when I'm taking him out for a dog walk. So, love the podcast, Martin. think you've done an amazing thing for the industry. You should be super proud of yourself. And well done, Sarah, for pushing him into doing something like this. I just love contact centres and do a lot of stuff around in and around contact centres and especially tech. Who are you passing the baton to? Sorry, I'll just go on to Justin because you're next in my screen. <coughs> Thanks, Neris. Um, yeah, I'm Justin Haynes. I'm the COO at Doge. We're quite a fast growing um, payments uh, business in the fintech space. Um, and um, I know probably met some of you from, and certainly Martin and Sarah from when I was at Ovo Energy, uh, which is basically about 500 yards across the road from me in Bristol. And um, yeah, and lots of faces that are familiar from judging and conferences and so on. So uh, looking forward to chatting to you all. Oh, I need to pass on to, I'm gonna to go to James. Ah, thank you. So James Rebel, so the, um... Uh, Director of International Contact Centres for Air France, KLM. So um, I think this will be my third time on the podcast. Um, and um, really pleased to be on here. I mean, it's <clears throat> great now that I think there's been 100 episodes of podcasts dedicated to contact centres, which I didn't think I'd see in my lifetime. Uh, and, and, and Martin's kind of morphed into this modern day parky for the uh, contact center industry as well, which is which is which is great. Um, so that's uh, more like more. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really good, and I think you know it's put the contact centers uh, uh, on the map. And uh, I must admit, so I started to do some podcasting, and I, I got to eleven episodes, which is completely random, and I was totally shattered and demoralized <laughs> by the fact that no one listened to it, only me and my mum. So uh, well done for getting to 100 and left so many people listening to you. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll pass on to Sham. Hey, <clears throat> my name is Sham, uh, currently Head of Customer Service at Selfridges, the best department store in the world, um, just saying. Um, I've known Martin forever, 
um, and Martin and I, we were talking long before the podcast was a thing. And actually, Martin, quick story, inspired me to write probably my first ever LinkedIn blog post. Um, and um, those blog posts led to a lot of people reaching out to me saying, oh, my God, I've had a similar journey to you or I relate to your journey within the contact center industry. I'm now 20 years deep in the game, they say, um, in the world of contact centers. And I've done all the roles from picking up the phone to being a team leader, walking the floor and all the way up to strategy, which is what I cover today. Um, and I've always been talking to Martin about getting on the podcast. He eventually conceded and allowed me to come on. Uh, that's a lie. He actually traveled all the way to London to, to, to put me on. So I really appreciate that. Um, and then I came back a couple of times and I think I'm the first person to make Martin Crown a podcast. So uh, yeah. <laughs> it don't, wasn't try, don't, don't try again today. No, no, I, I won't do that. Yeah. But um, yeah, I've been chatting to Martin, not just about call centers, but Martin briefly touched on uh, weight loss journey that I'm going through. So I've, I've struck up an actual friendship with Martin outside of contact centers. Um, and hopefully whatever happens today, we'll still be friends afterwards. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> of course, but it, now you've got me worried. <laughs> no, no, don't worry. You'll be all right. So I will pass over to Gareth. Uh, hi. Yes, yeah, so I'm Gareth Brophy. So currently head of service delivery for Cytel, um, but I've been knocking around the industry for a, a, a number of years now and uh, know a lot of people. Uh, on this uh, on this session, um, thanks Martin for inviting me along. Um, at first, I thought you invite me to appear on on my own one to one, um, but you know, I guess it's even better being with we'll all these amazing people leave. on the call. <laughs> uh, the avid listener of of the podcast, and I have been really. And you know what? Over the last kind of hundred episodes, um, it's been great to have a familiar face uh, and voice, um, especially on those um, on those uh, long days working from home. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you for having me here. Thank you. Who are you passing to, Gareth? Um, I'm going to pass over to David. Thanks, Gareth. Nice one. Hi, everybody. I, uh, I know Martin well through, obviously, Europe, through European Contact Centre Awards. We've known each other for a couple of years, haven't we? And, and I listen to the podcast either, well, I've, I've repointed my patio listening to the podcast, but more frequently running on the treadmill um in the week so i recognize all your voices because i'm a spotify listener but uh, it's yeah, finally good to see you all i'm a director of customer at uh, the atlanta group um we've got lee marjorie with us as well today is uh, we work together at atlanta um so that's another pleasant surprise to see lee with us and um yeah i've been in contact centers for about 20 years long time i got into the podcast as i was trying to move from human resources into customer world um and it's really helped me along that journey um so I've, I've got lots of information out of it um and as i said on my episode i like to try and give as much back as i possibly can and the community you've created martin's just been a fabulous part of that uh, and congratulations on 100 uh, as per everybody else which leaves me passing to i would pass to leave i'm going i'm going to pass to alice because you i think i think ladies first on the last two if tracking the dots has uh, been successful <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Alice Henderson. I'm the development lead for the John Lewis Partnership for Customer Care. So recently taken over being responsible for Waitrose and John Lewis. So essentially strategy, CI, communications, uh, change governance, you name it. Um, and unlike some of what you've some of you have said around the, the, the many years you've had in contact centre industry, I've, I've worked for the partnership for 20 years. So I've come at it from a slightly different angle where I came up from a retail operational retail route and then moved across into uh, contact centres, loved it and have stayed there. Uh, and it kind of hooks you in in a way that I, I didn't realise at the time it was going to. And um, so for me, this this whole the, the podcast and get out of rap was brilliant because how do you for 20 years in the same business make sure that you are 
keeping up with the latest trends, that you're using the right insights and you're, and ultimately this was just a brilliant uh, build on networking because actually that's how you sustain your knowledge and build on that and, and look for other opportunities. And I think Sarah actually was the one that, uh, that made the connection for us, wasn't it, Sarah? Um, and actually introduced me to Martin because uh, I think there was a bit of actually, am I an expert in my field now? Can I say that I am? Um, and so that was very much how the, the conversation started with Martin. It was brilliant. It was just like we were chatting in your living room, it, you know, and it ended up into a podcast, which was fantastic. And um, yeah, like any others, I've, I've listened to many of them myself because you just get some brilliant nuggets as well. So they're just in so valuable. Um, so yeah, I'm just pleased to be part of this podcast that's celebrating the 100. I can't wait till it's the 200 and we're doing this in 200 times. Thank you. Lee, I think this is... Great, thank you, yeah. Um, so I'm Lee Marjorie, I'm um, Head of Operations for Swinton Car and Home Insurance uh, in Atlanta Group. Um, worked in contact centres for about 20 years now and it's always surprising when I say that out loud that it's been 20 years. <laughs> Um, and fortunate enough, to, fortunate enough to work a few of those years alongside Sarah Hunt, who obviously we all know is fabulous. I just thought I'd big you up, Sarah. Um, listen to the podcast as well, Martin, and really excited to be involved in recording of this one. Um, 101 is a real great milestone. And I think, like everyone was saying, um, obviously everyone's really passionate about call centre. So it'd be great to have a really good conversation about how they're moving forward and how we can influence that change. Hey, thanks very much. It's um it's really lovely to hear all the things you're saying and it kind of something uh, that's got me thinking you get could get you a bit reflective and one of the things I thought is uh there's a couple of people who are not here today but would be good to get their side their view of it because Sham you mentioned me coming to London of course this this the podcast started before the pandemic but the vast majority of the hundred have been done virtually and you kind of just I I just had a bit of a mindset that I'll just say, I'll say yes more often than I say no. So when people are interested in being um, guests, my default setting is, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, uh, but that has led to some awkward, not awkward because of the person, but awkward from my point of view encounters. Um, yeah, well, be prying on one of the episodes, we'll get to that, Sham. But um, for a couple of people, it wasn't, virtual I know James me and you met a, a lovely location we work and you know funky sort of place but for t uh, two guests I actually they were staying in hotels and I met them in the, we did the podcast in the hotel room and I've never <laughs> met them before so it was like going you know go to room 307 <laughs> I'm here for a podcast honestly and it's um but what's but what's great is uh Alice something you said I think for the vast majority of guests, there is an element, even if it's not verbalised, of um, why would anyone want to hear from me? You know, kind of, should I, do I trust in what I'm saying? And then that, that fear very, very quickly gets trampled by the fact that you just engage in a conversation with, with people that are passionate about our um, industry. And it's just been... It's just been great. I think one of the main questions I get asked a lot is, are you, are you nervous before you hit record or before you meet someone? And yeah, absolutely, I, I am. Because the way I've seen it now is it's more just about hopefully putting people at ease and giving them the platform to be able to share, share their knowledge because we all, we all benefit from it. You know, this kind of democratization of, information and knowledge I think it's we've always been ahead of the curve on that as an industry um, and that's all I've been trying to do every single episode I take so much from and you get to meet lovely people like yourselves so what could be better than that like you know yeah definitely looking forward to another another hundred but I just wanted to kick off really by um, asking you and please be, you know, candid. What what would you like to see change, or um, are there any kind of things you thought would be good to see in the next hundred? Are the episodes too long? Uh, you know, maybe more jokes, James. 
I got one, no, Martin. I don't, I don't think so. Judging by the last joke before we went on air, Martin, I think we made enough <laughs> jokes. No, but I think, I don't know, actually, actually we, we're going now back to the office. I don't know, maybe um, a, an episode from a contact centre um, and, um, you, know, uh, you know, from the floor there as well, which I think is really a nice segue from a period which has been uh, testing for us all uh, as contact centre professionals, but I'm really pleased and, and having worked, uh, you know, listened to the podcast and worked a lot on the, on the judging and the CCMAs, the, the X's and the UK ones as well. A lot of innovation has come out, a lot of reactivity, a lot of proactivity from it. And I think we can hold our heads up high as um, uh, customer service professionals to say that I think the teams have really done such a great job at trying to deliver um, uh, a lot of difficult information during difficult times for people. Um, and then, you know, probably celebrating an episode to celebrate getting back into the office uh, as well, because as much as I've been a champion for home working for such a long time, um, there is that something which is quite unique about being on the floor of a contact centre. Well, on the floor, I mean being there. I mean not prostrate on that, but uh, you know, being in the in, in the centre and and mixing with customer service professionals. And I, I think there was a certain, there's a certain vibrancy about that. So I don't know if you are keen to test that out because yeah. uh, more things can go wrong for you. But uh, it's like real live live uh, in the moment stuff. But that that may be nice. A really good point i'd love to do more you know not just one but a lots of episodes where it's frontline um customer facing people it's team leaders it's your contact center um manager because a lot of the time like even with the article that um i shared with you all it's i think we would all naturally have a view in it based on our experience but to be able to hear it from people that are doing the job you know i'm still dining out on the fact that I was on the phones, but that was 25 years ago, you know. So. And, and picking up on James's point there, I think doing it live from a calling floor, I've always wanted this idea of like tales from the calling floor, like tales from the unexpected. And, and, you know, I spend a lot of time with advisors auditing and listening to them. And I listen to some hilarious calls, like sitting in a council when someone rings and says, my rat has gone missing so can you tell all your sweepers to stop um <laughs> like not kill any rats until i found it there's some real perlers out there and an amalgam of potentially some funny stories could think about like humanizing the contact center agents and just bringing some of that you know those nuggets to life great idea justin you were gonna you you had an idea yeah, I um I was reflecting on um podcasts, various podcasts I listen to on different topics and so on. I'm thinking how I choose which ones, and and um I think that I often will do it based on um, themes rather than just the person. So I think sometimes having some shorter ones around uh, a theme, because often people are don't necessarily want to listen to one person they don't know for fifty minutes, but if it's on a particular theme that's of interest to them, then then that could be really useful. And uh, and also I think just as a change, um, just sometimes just to have two or three people, one or two, I think, you know, I don't think you could do it with this number every time, but um, um, just having a couple of people, just bouncing off, having a discussion, just with even just you and two guests and uh, and just, just mixing up. I'm not saying you do that every week and I'm sure that adds to your admin logistics and so on, but I, I should think the odd theme and just, just having it a bit different really, rather than just an interview with one person. I thought trying that might be useful. Yeah, that's great. And that, cause that from a group point of view or from more than one, I think there's only been a couple. Um, so yeah, really, really good shout. And the themes one, yeah, again, themed and shorter. Yeah, it's brilliant. I think um, something about how you kind of distill the information, you know, like a load of people said didn't they, they listen to it and get a couple of nuggets out of it or key points, whether there's something around kind of creating some content around that as well. Yeah, this kind of one of the things that um, much like a quality analyst, I guess, when I listen back afterwards, it's for um, audio editing rather than always be keeping an eye out for the content and I think kind of just tracking the great stuff that you you all say and pulling out five bits of great stuff and maybe sharing that as a as part of the publication um, would be great because 
you're asking a lot of people to listen um, for that length of that length of time. And if you, there was a way that they might be interested in an episode, it might help them decide whether they're going to listen or not. If they could just read the the kind of five takeaways from from each episode. Obviously, for that. most of you, it'd be hard to get it just to five. There's two, there's hundreds. I love Neris's point about humanizing it as well with the stories and all the really good stuff that goes on, not making it kind of like a, a parody of itself, but kind of really bringing that human element out, out of it. I really, I think that's a great point. Yeah, stories from the call center. I think there could be, it feels a bit like what's the program where people can win 200 pounds by sending in a video clip of something going wrong. You know, there's, there's the story element to that, which I think could be a fantastic fantastically funny um, thing for people to enter in stories around so yeah but I also agree with, with Justin I think on on having themes and subjects that you know that people can tune in and listen to learn about specific areas and you know there, there's so much expertise within this industry and as I said earlier on you know the platform that, that podcasting gives people to really express themselves and, and just to lay down some thoughts and, and you're brilliant at extracting those those thoughts from people as well I think I think it's you know, th th there's so many more stories that can be told and, and, and experts that we can tap into to tell tell their stories. I think, Martin, on, um, on the video you've done today on the, you know, on the online platform <clears throat> around you narrowing into the team leaders, I think, um, if I think back to uh, the type of stuff we were talking about uh, and some of the models that get talked about, which, you know, sometimes quite difficult to describe and follow, particularly when you're on a treadmill, but there you go. Um, if you could download those later, you know, so you could get the link to the online site and the two things are very connected where I can, I can then, then if I want to pinch that model, I can go and, go and pinch it. I, I'd be happily provide loads of the stuff that I would talk about for people to download, use later. I think that's a great, a great idea. And it also points to generally how everyone has been in terms of everyone wants to share, everybody wants everyone to to win the very fact that you're coming on a podcast and and sharing best practice and tips and your journey just points to the fact that everyone is more than open to to share and also you know explain things and this is great because a lot of the time I 90 percent of the time I am hearing stuff for the first time and kind of going yeah that's brilliant because I, I don't know much <laughs> you do now <laughs> No, it's all gone. <laughs> I have to listen again. <laughs> yeah, but, and that's, that, it's also to Justin's point and kind of, kind of to David's point, it's about the sort of thinking about how you could retrospectively tag some of the, the, the key themes that come out. David, yours, I'm a bit fans only here because yours is my favourite episode. Is it Alton Towers you started at? Is that right? Yeah. So yeah, that's fun. right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> fan zoning you um but did you also talk about tribes was that you or was that somebody else no i don't think that was me but i, I know the tribes episode I, and, and i listened to some episodes multiple times because i want to go back and get get that nugget um so that that you know that happened yeah so, i did tribes yeah yeah, yeah. I love that. that's really oh yes because you're at dojo now trying yeah, that's really interesting. So stuff like that, it's thinking about how do you extract some of the great stuff that's come out of the ones that have gone so far as well as going forward. Have you had, has anyone had any kind of unexpected contact after um, doing it? Or have you had any contact from people that have said, I, I listened to it and picked your brains or... I had um, I had someone who um, works for me up in the Hull Contact Centre, and her um, boyfriend is a professional rugby league player for Hull, and um, and he listened to it. I thought that was a bit weird. It's not even in from the industry. <laughs> so yeah, that's my claim to fame: professional sports. Age. And he he found it really interesting. I mean, apparently, I was going to say, did he uh, enjoy it? Apparently, yeah. Apparently, yeah. He took a lot from it. I don't know if she's making up, but yeah, you know, I'll take it. <laughs> I've actually, you know, I've, I've had a few um, just new starters at Sabio joining and, and, you know, that they're pointed to that to listen into just to get our thoughts on, you know, the specifics of our take on the industry and the technology side of it. So, yeah, that that's it, just as an internal tool, it's been really useful to 
um, establish our thinking in a certain area. And uh, yeah, that, that's been really helpful. I think if anyone, any of you guys are going to be interviewing people, if they haven't listened to your episode, they're missing a massive trick. I, I mean... To, to um, Alice's point about expanding your network, that's kind of what it's done for me because um, I I talked about the menopause, didn't I? And, and me and you, Martin, I was like dreading talking about it. But actually what it's done is lots of people have, have reached out to me about that and have joined a couple of groups and, uh, and other kind of parts around that. So that's been interesting and useful. I think the network bit is massive. Well, that's a whole other um street like a whole other topic isn't it is the issues that we've spoken about you know that as a direct result of you sharing um i still remember that now you know the kind of 52 symptoms but as a direct result of that i know at bpa quality due our hr director kind of really went into action and absolutely kind of was cheering you to the rafters and we we all became more um, aware of everything that uh, the menopause brings and we have a menopause policy now and that all came about because you came on and um, spoke about it and that, that that's the power of it though isn't it that's what you know and that was you getting that kind of conversation out because we didn't plan it well, it's a little bit like our one sham wasn't it just kind of um, it was very topical at the time about um, Black Lives Matter and I think it's you know that just it kind of goes to show it's quite risky but it shows that it's the, the podcasts aren't always that well planned <laughs> yeah I mean your, your format is interesting because I think before we joined I was thinking I need to prepare for this and you said no let's just come and have a chat so I took you up on that and you're right it was topical we were talking about Black Lives Matter and I found and I think others on here will probably relate that the contact center through its very nature even 20 years ago when I first stepped into it, incredibly diverse, top to bottom, left to right. Um, that open plan nature of office, people doing different shifts. And I worked in the 24 hour call center and then, and then you get different languages as well. And so that always been a good barometer for diversity. And um, whilst I absolutely wanted to talk about contact centers, I enjoyed the opportunity of talking about Black Lives Matter and um, how I can sort of help with that. And so it, it was a great opportunity, um, incredibly emotional um, for all the right reasons. Um, yeah, and it, it was brilliant. Um, I enjoyed it. That's not just our industry inside and out, isn't it? We, we don't exist in a vacuum. I think we're, we've all pretty much stayed and loved this industry because of human connection, right? And that means that you talk about things that are happening and we've, we've all shared a, a horrible two years. Um, why, how could you not talk about that and talk about um, connections? One of, in terms of unexpected outcomes, one of the things that's happened as a result of this is my mum now knows what I do for a job, but what she'll do, I, I'm sorry, but I don't think there's a more avid fan. She listens, she listens to it and then she sends texts that you, like you wouldn't believe i might i might one day just share them in the kind of appendix of a book they're just it my mum is just the loveliest person ever and and, and it's all very positive but it just takes forever sorry mum <laughs> to, to go through her text but she would text after listening to everyone and make some interesting points and questions but she absolutely now knows what i do for a job not podcasting but the industry Sounds like you need her on, on episode 101. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, well, my dad can sit in the background and we'll just occasionally talk about Tottenham. Tottenham feature heavily in the podcast, I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> I need to get um, my kids to listen to it because they don't know what I do. <laughs> well, that, yeah. might, that might be quite a nice segue into the um, article that I shared with everyone. And it's... Um, it, it, it's about work-life balance and it's about um, technology. But again, what it says is for people, you wouldn't want to go and work in a contact centre because you are turned into, and the phrase it uses is banal cyborgs because 
you are scripted and every second of your day is monitored and you can be sacked if you respond in a, a negative way, even though you might have encountered daily abuse from callers. And I just thought it'd be interesting to get everyone's opinion on, first of all, I guess, does this reflect the reality of where we're at in terms of it's still uh, an unpleasant job to be on the phones? I, when I read it, I just thought that um, <clears throat> it kind of reflected what people think contact centres are like rather than actually what they are. And I think it, there is an element of monitoring too much. And myself and Sarah have talked about this constantly. And it, it, it's one of the things that frustrates me most about working in a contact centre. And back to Sean's point about saying we're a diverse culture and we're forward thinking. We are on one side and there's like an oxymoron. Then we just control everything and manage individuals in a draconian way. I just think, at what point are we going to wake up and think that's not the right way to do something with through, through a group of people that are so diverse and different and want to, to work mm -hmm. as, as people and, and interact? And so I, th I think when I read the article, I thought, really sounds like someone that maybe has that skirted the view of what contact sounds like. And it's kind of an external view rather than reality. Really interesting point. I, I, I don't, has anyone ever read a book uh, called Factfulness by Hans Rosling. It's a really, really interesting book. If you haven't read it, I'd, I'd advise you to. But basically what it talks about is that people's opinions of the state of the world, and it covers everything from population growth to uh, literacy to, you know, conditions in third world, exactly, poverty and those kind of things. But all of our perceptions are based on data that was is 20, 30 years old. And immediately I thought m th these you know, artic the article talked more about the perceptions of the industry, maybe as it was in its infancy 20 plus years ago. And actually the reality of the industry now, it's a hard job, no doubt. You know, people work incredibly hard and they're processing lots and lots of interactions with customers one after the other. However, contact centers are incredibly fun places to work. You know, they're very nurturing places to work. They're diverse, as, as we said before. And, and I, I just think it's a very outdated view of the industry as it stands today and probably as it has been for the last decade or so in my view it does worry me though that people still have that view of us and i think that it's something as an industry we don't do enough to do to promote ourselves and to actually show people how we've changed um you know and you know people don't see contact centers as a career still a lot of people just see it as a stop gap to to make a little bit of money and you know especially now with the recruitment market being what it is, you know, it, it's the time to go out and really shine a light on the fact that we're not that old, stuffy, you know, very rigid um, industry that we were in, a, you know, and we, we've, we've changed a lot. And, and what I thought was funny about that article is actually we've used technology within the industry to actually improve the experience and make things so much better and actually technology has helped us to get there rather than being something that's kind of blocked us and and, and it's you know yeah it was it was i agree a very outdated uh, view of a contact center i think that probably i mean going back to the, the, the podcast in general as well i'm not sure if that's how what you set out for martin but effectively and hopefully this permeates beyond and into those people that do have that perception, but it's trying to break that, that, that perception of, you know, what it is. And it's fairly lazy. And, you know, you're in a stand-up comedy routine, someone mentions contact centres and they want to know it, it, it automatically generates some kind of negative, um, you know, there's quite a lot of stigma that goes with it. And I think going back 25 years, I was the first one as a cocky upstart when asked when I was on a temporary contract, would I want to go into a permanent one with a contact centre? I said, over my dead body. And I see 10 years later. Who's I'm laughing into, now? Yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's, you know, I, and I, I wouldn't leave it because it's, it, it's all the things that I thought it wasn't. Um, it's, it's, it, it has been, um, really amazing and, and to be able to 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 to, to help in, in changing that and to try to change perceptions of, of what that is and to proudly say when someone asks me you know what do you do I work in a contact center no I'm not a director of contact center I work in a contact center and then if I'm just waiting for someone to challenge me it must be a bit dull yeah nobody does but if they did you know to really defend it vehemently because I totally agree it's such a vibrant place 
uh, to work. Um, and, and that's why I'm really pleased now that people are starting to go back to the office just to, to recreate those connections uh, and that buzz, um, which you do feel. And then you go around to see a really good contact centre, you can feel it as soon as you open up the door. And, and I don't think people can, can necessarily appreciate that. So this is why, you know, they're going back to the suggestion to, to, to do the podcast from a contact centre. If you can feel that buzz in the podcast, Oh, you smashed it. We are um, in danger, though, of being the choir here, right? Because we're not at the sharper side of it. Um, so, you know, at the beginning, I'd speak to 100 customers a day. And now I might speak to one a week. And usually that's an incredibly angry, angry, angry customer. Um, so, yeah, I love it. But walking the floor and talking to advisors who've just taken their 50th call and they're trying to beat last week's productivity or the productivity target that has been set as 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 a nation not just within contact center productivity seems to be the silver bullet for everything um it's going to recover the economy it's going to do lots of wonderful things for everyone and um i guess to some of the earlier points made on here, speaking to advisors and asking them, I, I think you might get a slightly different answer. Yeah, I, don't, I, I think you can hold both positions, right? You can be absolutely evangelical about what a great industry that this is, but also recognize there's either contact centers that are still some way behind, not very progressive, but even in the ones that are progressive, the, the job of an agent is a really tough one. You know, it, it has got better and I don't think the article is balanced at all, but you know, I, it, it is tough, isn't it? it interestingly today, um, I, saw a, I saw a TikTok and it was about, it was a, of a podcast of Scottish comedians. It's very, very random, I know, but, um, they, they were talking about another bit and they were talking about something else. And then one of the, the hosts said to this guy, you used to work, work in a call centre, didn't you? And I thought, oh, here we go. And I was expecting it to be, he would just start rinsing it. And um, I can't tell you the first bit. He said, I will share it afterwards, but the first bit is, uh, there's too many effing and jeffing words in it. But what he said was people that work in call centres, because he only... He said he had six weeks training and lasted two weeks after that in a live environment. But he said for people that stay and work there, they should be offered high pressure jobs in the future because he said their EQ and their resilience is off the charts. And he said NASA needs to come down and he referenced this street in Glasgow where there's a lot of call centres. He said NASA just need to come down here on a fag break and they can get all their next astronauts. Right. He said, because no matter what happens, no matter how much they're bombarded with, agents that have lasted and that enjoy the job are just superhuman. And I was like, this is brilliant. This is great because there isn't enough of that. There's, there can be um, bits like articles like this that do make us think, right, well, how, what are we doing? Are we doing enough? But equally, there should be the other side as well like the guy that's been on um, Dragon's Den, Stephen Bartlett said, being a call center agent prepared him to be a CEO. You know, and it's kind of, we, what, to Gareth's point, what more can we do to kind of give a balanced view of what our industry is like? And absolutely hearing from people doing the job, warts and all, I think as well, you know, just need to hear people say, yeah, it's not, it, it isn't any good and it, it needs to change. Yeah, on know? that note, Martin, um, and, and I'll use your term about the comedian, but love that. <laughs> um, can I ask Gareth a question? So you are here, you know, and um, you're obviously working at one of the largest outsourcers. Now, there's just over 800,000 agents in the UK. 250,000 of them are sitting in outsource worlds. So to the point around oxymorons, you're under a contractual obligation to deliver to you know productivity slas kpi yeah. so as a so as a cohort of outsourcers do you ever get together to tra challenge any of this out of interest so do you know what in the outsource world it's very competitive and we don't 
talk to each other and we don't share because of that competitive element so it's hard and and i've only recently gone to the outsourcing side and i found that i went to the outsourcing side and lots of doors closed for me because all of a sudden you know it, you know i'm a i'm a competitor um so yeah it it, it <laughs> you know but yeah. i i think i think you you are right being an outsourcer it's a relationship you have with your client on how you deliver everything that the client wants, but still have that duty of care to the to the people that are working for you, um, you know. And it, it's setting those realistic expectations with with everybody, you know. And but it, it is a tough gig, and it is a tougher gig, I think, um, for an agent working for an outsourcer than I, sometimes it is working for for in house because I because I've seen both sides of that. Um, and you have some. Uh, clients that are really demanding because you know and you have some clients that that aren't because they get it um and it's an it's, again it's an educational piece isn't it? it's educating yeah. you know that you, your client you know on on what to expect just as much as it is educating your you know your advisors and your agents on on, on what to expect yeah yeah, yeah. thanks michael hi everybody sorry my joining the party a little bit late, but it's good to see everyone. Is everybody well? Michael. Say we are recorded as well, I should have said, sorry. <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's Thursday, so it's, it's actually uh, my Friday. So this is my Friday, Friday evening. So I'm now starting to think about what I'm going to do to wind down after I've condensed uh, uh, five days in, into into four, but um, but yeah, I'm really good. Well, let's start there because we we were just talking about the article I shared that said it still had a, a negative view of call centres that everything is strictly monitored. That for uh, we we go out of our way to create cyborgs on as from individuals on the front lines, and we we were just talking about that. Now for you guys at Atom you have done something probably like that a lot of people thought wouldn't be possible um, in a call centre world and gone to a four day week. How, how's that gone? Yeah, so from a contact centre perspective, it's um, it's interesting because, you know, it, it, we've, convent, we, we've condensed uh, kind of uh, 37 and a half hours down, down into 34. So you, you just can't make that up in, t in, in terms of productivity gain. All right, you just you just can't. So, from a contact centre perspective, it's an investment. Um, yes, we've seen improvements in terms of attrition and, and and absence, which you can throw into the the, the cost mix. But in the round, uh, from a contact centre agent perspective, on the phone for X amount of hours taking X amount of contacts, etc., um, it doesn't. It, it, it's not cost neutral, it's an investment. And it's an investment of around 10% on the cost base. Um, but for the rest of the organization that aren't directly customer facing, um, that's a completely, it's a different story, right? And it's a different story because again, we've seen in terms of the top level measures, improvements in attrition and improvements in absence and improvements in terms of overall well-being customer measure, um, internal customer measures. Uh, and also we've seen improvements in terms of external customer measures as well. Our customer goodwill scores improved and, and PS has gone up. So, you know, there are, there are things that are directly accountable um, when it comes to the four day week in that, um, you know, over, overall, yes, we've reduced our our hours, but a lot of the measures have improved, which means that a lot of a lot of that reduction in hours has been paid for. But the contact center specifically is an investment of around ten percent. What challenges have you had, Michael? With it, it can't, can't all been easy. There must be some logistics, and people are off on the day when people want to see them, and so on. Sure. Yeah. So again, if I if I just talk about the rest of the business, so the rest of the business went through this, you know. Uh, are we going to have people off on a Monday? Are we going to have people off on a Friday type thing? And actually that's settled down now in that the vast majority of the support um, areas, if you like, and the rest of the business functions 
um, a, a technology, for example, you know, uh, change, etc. They're all off on a Friday, so we've we've got to that point now where where we we, we we've got that very simple answer. Uh, when it comes to the contact center operations, however, um, of course, you know, we've always been a, a seven day operation anyway. We were 365 actually, but we, we reduced that to COVID uh, due to COVID. Um, so we just had to work that through in terms of uh, our scheduling. You know, we just, you know, it's just a, a resource management question. We have to have coverage across the week, how we're going to do it. But we've got um, one of those, one of those additional days that pe people work, they're going to have to have that off. And that goes into the sausage machine and then we, we We've got new shift pans, etc. Um, so, so yeah, so that that's the way it's worked. The vast majority of the business now has a Friday off. Operations, you know, it fluctuates, um, but we've got coverage, frontline coverage, seven days a week. You think, wouldn't you, that after um, something like the pandemic, and as as an industry getting everyone home all of a sudden everyone's home working and these things were never considered possible, certainly not in the timescales that everyone did it, that why can't we look at breaking at least the perception of everything being scrutinised from an advisor point of view? Has anyone ever sort of tried removing all KPIs from an, from an advisor's world, maybe still keeping them behind the scenes to to look at, but from an advisor point of view and their perception of their day and their work, freeing them up. M&S, you know, didn't they? Oh, yeah. Go on, Doris, carry on. No, M&S did it. And then I, um, when we were doing the European judging, Allianz, um, did, they had a really interesting story where they literally just let the agents work their day that was a really interesting um submission so but i know marks and spencers went from the standard kpis to literally just csat you know and yeah maybe one other i was like why are you not um, i know your adherence <laughs> but. i know um booper, booper at one point were doing self-managed teams where you almost managed your resource planning from the shift perspective so 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 things were measured but it was measured within the team and the team had control of managing those measures so that that was an interesting one as well they've done it in certain teams they've not been able to roll it out across the board but it's worked in certain teams if both used the word interesting is that code <laughs> <laughs> they were interesting was it did it did they did you like it did it work and what i saw from booper yeah absolutely yeah, um, and gave so much more autonomy and attrition was low and, you know, people kind of talk to each other to manage the, the workload. Yeah, and I think I used it because it was really interesting. Yeah, me but too I, as well. I approach it with a, uh, you, you have a degree of ingrained cynicism. Yeah. Right, you're like, how does that? How can you not look at your adherence in the day, and all that side of stuff? But you, but it, it was impressive, is what it actually was, and it was a very similar model that Sarah's just explained. So, yeah, it was impressive. We started to look at um, the whole adherence thing, and I wanted to bring in as much autonomy to the agents during their day because I think that's really, really important. We, we, we do measure. I think as much autonomy you can bring in and we share the overs and unders at 15 minutes throughout the day at the beginning of the week and basically called it out of the out of the white and into the red and basically agents could just shift and say actually I can see masses of white here and fortunately being in the middle of Manchester pre-COVID I see massive white here I fancy a really long lunch I'll take my hours there and I'll just give you some more eyes back later when you're in the red and they just managed that through during the week with their TL. And that was really popular because people could then flex their work-life balance and they felt a little bit more controlled. And we let them take their breaks whenever they wanted to as well. Because often, you know, you look at, you spend hours looking at your adherence figures and what does it really tell you? A couple of advisors were late on a call and that's it. And you spent all that wasted time looking at that when most advisors are not taking the mickey and taking long, yeah. a long break, you know. And I, the biggest frustration I find with the closely monitoring is who spend so much time trying to prove they're not doing what they should be doing 
that you miss the good stuff they are doing and the time you should be spending coaching and developing. You do run out of those reports. Oh, look, I've proved I've lost 3% productivity this week. Well, I've just spent 50 hours of a team leader or uh, optimizes time. So you, you just wipe that productivity saving out. So give the time to the agents. There will be some that take the mickey. That'll wash out. That'll flush out. But, you know, those figures need to come away. It's in the moment taking the call and as much time as you give them back. Take your breaks when you want out of the, yeah. the white into the red. As much accountability as you can. Yeah. It, 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 feels, it feels to me a bit like the contact centre is probably one of the most productive teams or departments in any organization you know the, 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 there probably isn't a more productive department anywhere in, in you know in any organization than a contact center and maybe you know looking for productivity gains elsewhere or at least using the data that's collected by the contact center to figure out why are people calling and fixing the problems upstream you know that that's probably a better a better source of productiveness in most organizations and you know and and the contact center, unfortunately, still is a bit of an island in, in terms of it, it's the, the, the recipient of, of the, you know, the, the issues that the rest of the organization are creating. So, you know, a more joined up contact center to every other part of the business, I think, would, would probably yield much better productivity than trying to squeeze more out of out of the people that are already working incredibly hard. I think one of the tricks is, right, that people, we all want to know if we did a good day's work today, don't we? Like you want to know that what you did was worthwhile and there was some return for that and, and, and you're making progress and you're contributing. Um, the problem with a lot of the contact center KPIs, in my opinion, is they're out of the control of the people that are being judged by them. And I, and I think, so, so we took all the targets out at Aegeus and we got to a point where the uh, judgment of a good day's work was what came through the voice of the customer platform mm -hmm. and whether the demand coming from customers was stuff we wanted and stuff they wanted or we didn't and we engaged them in fixing those problems so you know it was more interesting uh, it was engaging they could see the results still but they weren't oppressed by things um, or unfairly judged in their opinion by things they couldn't control and, and that made a, a huge cultural difference and then you get all the better attendance lower attrition people progressing through the ranks more people wanting to join and we did that in a relatively small area to begin with on a particular contract and people started to walk towards it. They were like, well, what's the great stuff that's going on there? And then it, and, and then it grew relatively quickly once we'd, once we'd nailed it. I'd love to have been there just to see those first sort of, those first meetings where you say, right, everything now is based on the voice of the customer, everything. Just do we run around, do yeah. what you want. Oh, well, I won't quite run around, do what you want, but the, we had a willing partner. We had a willing partner, you see, that where their values align, we are an outsourcer, so their values aligned well to that model, first of all. So, you know, it was, a, it was a, it, the door was ajar. I guess that made it a little bit easier. Yeah, David, we had, um, we're absolutely similar in that sense that, that we've got a specific role now that was created out of our new operating model, which is voice of the customer. And we have that customer radar um, that basically highlights the pain points. And that's where we put all our energy into focusing on how can we support our partners in our business, they're called our partners and our agents to, to enable them so they're not having to, to deal with that painful conversation because it's always, for us, it tends to be upstream. That's where the issue really lies. And so therefore, if you can support fixing the pain point and being the wider voice for the business. So, um, and I think that's been a, a real change for us over the last two years is having that voice of the customer role that takes all the qualitative data from the customer to help uh, for the rest of the business to understand, actually, this is where this is happening. This is what we need to change. Um, and similarly, the other thing we introduced was uh, what we call partner ideas. And that's a platform so that anyone can feed into it around what the opportunities are. But not only can you raise your idea, you can then see who's going to own that idea. And then you have to follow that through and see how. And therefore, you can see where that is on its journey, whether it actually goes into development and it, it eventually is implemented or if there's a very good reason that it doesn't. So because it's interesting, I was reading this article, Martin, it was kind of saying there's little room for autonomous action. And I think, well, actually, no, I think that's changed, I think. There's lots of room for that now because actually a lot of what we're doing, we're simplifying and self-serving a lot of our journeys. So by default, you, you need individuals that actually have autonomy 
because therefore some of the calls that we have are far more complex in terms of how we need to manage them. So um, yeah, I was reading that. It's, it's very one-sided, absolutely. That's a shame, isn't it, that there isn't enough out there. Just kind of a reflection of what you've been talking about in that article, if it was placed in that article, would make such a difference, just in terms of a fair reflection of, of where we're at as an industry. I mean, you guys are great exponents of being, being progressive and trying to... Um, deliver excellent customer service whilst keeping employees engaged and wanting to stay in the industry and because we're we're challenged by getting in new talent at the moment and we've got to keep we've got to keep working at that but um you're definitely more of a reflection of this great industry than 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 this article and for the people listening i will share the article in the uh in the post um afterwards i think i, I don't Sorry, Sham, go on. Sorry, I apologise. Um, just picking up on what Alice was saying around the self-serve part of it. Maybe there's a bit in there um, around the, the more sort of repetitive, simpler contacts can be automated um, or removed by being fed further up the line, giving us an opportunity to reduce that overall inbound contact volume that an advisor has to deal with. And that's not to say to drive down the advisor headcount, but leveling up the advisor headcount. So, you know, the industry is somewhere around £10 an hour-ish for an advisor. But if you doubled that and you went to £20 an hour and you had people, you know, who were able to do whatever it is they wanted to do to solve it for the customer, um, and that's their goal, right, go and solve it. The, the attraction that you'll get at that pay rate will be not just that person who's passing through the contact center onto their second job, because often you'll either be stacking shelves or working in the call center as potentially your first job or whilst you're at uni or at college or elsewhere for, for, for some. And so there's a bit around using technology in the right way to take some of the contacts out and then what's left, allowing advisors to get the teeth into that, make a career out of it, um and then just to sort of bookend that if you take your contact center away from just being transactional and you can deliver sales or whatever the value is within your business then you can get away from the, the p l side of it or at least justify it so that you're not worried about the cost um you know michael used the word investment he didn't say cost once and i think that's quite an interesting way of putting it What's the investment within customer service? How can it pay back and give you the environment where you can then test autonomy and, and, and let it play through? Yeah, well, I think you're onto something really interesting here, which is, you know, what is the root cause of, 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 of this kind of, you know, image problem that our contact centres have had and that, that we're, not, we're not quite able to kind of turn the corner with? And I would argue it's because it's a, a reflection of, the lack of customer focus that we have within UK PLC, right? And, and we don't think about customers, and, and, and this is, you know, in the round UK PLC level, um, as, as, as we should. We don't see them as, as assets. We see them as kind of distractions and costs. And, and as a result, we see the people that deal with them as, as costs when we should be seeing them as assets. Now, the industry itself isn't going to be able to change that, right? That's a, that's a bigger uh, question. Um, but it's maybe something that the contact centre industry could lobby. But, you know, why, if, if that hypothesis is correct, why is that the case? You know, is that something that is inherent within, within this country and the way that we, we view customers? Right. Or, you know, where does that come from? If that's the case, you know, that, that, they're the kind of debates that I think we should be having because, you know, I take the point, right. There could be, there could be a number of different ways that we could try and address the issue. You know, you could say, right, actually, we're going to try and uh, pay people more, you know? So yeah, it's going to go to 20, 30 quid an hour, 40 quid an hour, you know, and that'll attract X, Y, and Z, but that isn't going to suddenly change the way that UK PLC sees customers, you know? 
think it's just gonna you're gonna have different people answering or, or dealing with the same the same problem, aren't you? Just at a very small, um, in no way is this kind of scientific, but um, the time I spent in Turkey, so in, in Istanbul, in a Turkish um, contact center, one of the first things that kind of really surprised me was the agent seemed to enjoy talking. And I'm very, I'm kind of careful about not making a really glib kind of statement but it was one of the things that I sat with my team Turkish team and, and spoke about and said everyone's it's far more animated stood up talking I said what can I see your scripts no scripts would run a mile if there were if there were scripts and the way they portrayed it to me right so it was we would never get anywhere near a sale or a service um, and it was a concierge type service, so it lent itself to talking more, but we would never get anywhere near dealing with the, what the customer wants unless we had a chat first about where are you. It was expected that you would talk and dealing with customers was the highlight of the, of the, of the day. And it struck me as different from, from what, I was, what I was used to. So, and I don't know where that sits in terms of what you said, Michael, around is this something inherent in the UK that we see customers as, in some cases, a kind of annoyance? Hi, Catherine, by the way. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and then as a result, if you've got a mindset which is, is much more customer-centric in the round at UK PLC level, then in, in that ideal world, you know, you would then start to see the people that deal with your customers as assets. Not, you know, you, you have that debate around cost center, profit center, you know. For me, this is about what, what are your business assets? And, and, and the agents who deal with your customers are nothing but assets. That, you know, but, and that's bleeding obvious to me, and it always has been. I mean, I'm, I, I might be a little bit... Um, uh, you know, driven by the fact that I, started, I left university and started my career on the phone, right? So I've been there, and I know how hard a job it is, um, and I know what value you can add to your organisation, but it, it still absolutely amazes me that there's organisations out there that don't think in that way, that their agents are assets providing um, an asset as well in terms of the way that they deal with the customers. You know, it's for me, it's just absolutely logical. However, there's a huge swathe of UK PLC that doesn't think like that. It amazes me. I still see that see it as, as a cost. I, I would agree. You, know, you could arguably capitalize uh, all of your agents potentially because they're providing a, they're an asset, providing assets. It's just sometimes it's intangible. Um, I'm going to kind of draw this to a close, sorry, Catherine, um, but maybe you can help us out here. I just wanted to um, ask you, for people that are listening, and maybe for Lee and Gareth as well, because we'll we will do individual uh, episodes, um, what advice would you give to people before coming on to the podcast? Oh gosh, you've put me on the spot there. I know. Um, well, sorry, you come in. <laughs> you come in last. You're going to get that kind of question. <laughs> Do you know what I've been doing? This probably won't surprise you. I've been sat in a Google Meet. But oh, anyway, that's my I fault. Really... <laughs> <laughs> that it's is fine. my fault. <laughs> I realised what I was doing, and then I, I thought, "Aha! There we are." Um, so, what advice would I give? So, I, I have thought about this a lot. Actually, it's almost like I predicted your question. Um, like there's some kind of mind messaging going on. But um, I suppose one of the things that um, I, I don't know if you remember, but when we spoke and you said, "Would you like to come on the podcast?" and I said, "Oh, I don't think I'm really that interesting. I think I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure you'll find enough things to talk to me about." and one of the things that was really, really good about it, apart from spending some time with your lovely self, um, was that you've, I think you, you realise over the course of the conversation that actually you've achieved quite a lot. 
and I think you make the conversation easy so if anybody's worried about the things that I was worried about don't worry about that because Martin will make it really easy for you to have that conversation but I think what happened on the back of it as operational people we often think about we don't think about ourselves do we We think about teams so it's a bit awkward going well I've done this and I've done that because you, you don't think like that in real life you think we did this and this was something we achieved together so once I kind of got over that hurdle and we had the conversation what was really sort of reaffirming for me was just the number of people that got in touch from people that I didn't know people that I'd never met and said do you know what that actually rang true and it was so lovely to hear a real person talking about their challenges and their career and kind of that we, they could empathize with that and they could take comfort from that so I think my advice in a nutshell would be don't worry about it because Martin will make it really easy for you and, and he's like a master at having a great conversation and he'll put you at ease but also um, you probably will add something to some people listening that perhaps you don't realize that you would Thank you very much. And um, I think there's something that we uh, spoke about before was I've got to get better, A, at uh, getting the invites right so it doesn't say <laughs> Google me and Zoom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go on both. Um, but one of the things that I need to get better at is sometimes I'm contacted about the guest. So, um, and again, I would love to, I, I will share these, but um, people have gone for jobs as a result of hearing somebody on the pod, hearing one of you guys on the podcast say, I just went for it, or my career has, has gone higgledy piggledy and I've and I doubted myself and so on and so on. There's been some lovely, lovely messages about people who um, were second guessing themselves about going for something, listened to a podcast, heard somebody say, I just went for it. I didn't think I'd get it. I really doubted myself and I got it and they've got it and they've got the job and it's just it's just amazing and I've got to get better at sharing that rather than just sort of wrapping myself up in it and going oh isn't that nice um, <laughs> but, but no I, I get that and I, and I was just listening to what Michael was saying about being an advisor and starting your career there and I think that's that's one of the fantastic things about listening to the podcast is we've all started in so many different roles and made loads of different careers. And that kind of illustrates the art of the possible, doesn't it? Completely, completely. Um, thank you um, everyone for, for joining and giving up um, some of your Thursday night. I mean, for, for Michael, it's the start of his weekend. So I really appreciate that. We're not all jealous at all. Um, thank you very much. It's been great to do something different for the, 100th episode and um keep listening everybody and let's 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 do some more of them let's do another 100 yeah absolutely thank you thanks martin for having us thank you thanks Brilliant. guys bye. 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 bye